Dave, so your band, the English Beat, started in 1979, and I guess the police started right about the same time. I remember seeing them. Mm -hmm. And I was curious as to why, why then? Why did the, uh, the English kind of pick up on the reggae beat, you know, from Jamaica and Trinidad, and kind of make that their own and kind of add to it and give it even a more, uh, you know, hip sort of uh, tone to it. Make it a little bit faster too, I think they did. More danceable. Yeah. Um, why do you think that happened? Well, there was all the various strands of what was known as the punky reggae party that uh, Bob Marley even sang about at some point. Uh, I think one of the things that forced it was that, at least in England, uh, punks and rasters were equally banned in most pubs and clubs in Birmingham. No punks, no rasters. And uh, especially anybody who got a chain going from nose to ear. <laughs> that was like a red rag to a book. No, nope, somebody's just going to rip it off, mate, and you're going to bleed all over the club. So it's better we just don't let you in. And um, so they were sort of outlaws together. And then if you had festivals, it quite often be a few punk bands and a reggae band like Steel Pulse or Aswad, perhaps, like socially conscious reggae band in the middle. And I think they used to have the kind of they were almost like they were the chill out room at a rave. You know, if you've got four or five punk bands, eight to 45 minutes, then <sighs> before you had the Clash or whatever at the end. And uh, Clash, of course, had been mixing dub and rock in a stylish way as well. So you've got all the various elements. But uh, what a lot of people over here might not know was that in the early 70s, the music on the soccer terraces, the football terraces, was the scar of the Trojan, tighten up volumes, one through four. Um, and they were, that was the music of the skinheads on the, the football terraces, who were the first kind of white kids who'd hung around with the black teenagers, who were the first sons of the first immigrants from Jamaica. So the rude boys and the skinheads had met over a pile of Trojan records and shared some of the same clothing because, and that's how the rude boy clothing developed, was from the Jamaican suited rude boy style and the English mod towny style. And the two of those would both end up with like a two-tone tonic shark skin suit, you know, slightly over manicured over them. But, um, hats and all of that, which became the two-tone man's kind of uh, uniform, really. Uh, so once you'd started the punky reggae party going and you were playing punk songs with a reggae beat or reggae songs with a punk beat, you noticed they also had a passing reference to the scar of the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, from the football terraces. Um, and so we went back and mixed some of that in the Prince Buster and stuff and mixed it back in and at that point it really just become hybrid crazy like we were just trying to make the perfect black rose we wanted each dance beat to just be oh you just couldn't stop yourself from wanting to dance to that even if you were white like some of us and couldn't really dance it would still make you want to have a go you know dance to the lyrics if you can't dance to the drums you know come <laughs> on everybody <laughs> at least you're moving you, you know? succeeded with that quite well <laughs> And so we did want a beat that was simple to move along to as well, you know, there's universal. And um, So you're saying white people can't dance? Uh, well, <laughs> English people seem to be, I, I think white people can dance if they're allowed to for long enough, if they're told it's If dirty. they have lessons? Uh, not that, I think just if it's socially acceptable because I, nobody told me white people couldn't dance till I come to America. Yeah, it's because we, you know, we, we did, say that. Yeah, we didn't know it. We we were all thought we could dance in England, and uh, <laughs> not that we would probably could that much better, but it's a matter of attitude, isn't it? And <laughs> it's what makes him feel. What you want to feel? It is kind of, you know. Uh, but it, uh, America's difficult, isn't it? It's the land of opportunity. It's also probably the most repressed place in many ways that's ever spoken the English language. You know. It's, uh, <laughs> It's like half the words are already banned. <laughs> You've only been messing with it for a couple of hundred years. You've got N words and B words. And Politically you, correctness. Oh, it's more than that, it's psychological cowardice. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> 
I don't know what it is, but it's something very weird. It's the same thing that would allow you to have like really graphic violence on television. But or, then you do live in California. The best and the worst of every possible world, I think. You know, uh, You're going to have to go to the library now to, ha to have fun. I, I absolutely adore living there, i got to say. I can't believe it. You know, they go, oh, the traffic, the traffic. You're like, no, it's a miracle. You've got like four or five million people all heading to the same place. Half of them haven't got a license, mm -hmm. and half of them don't read or speak a word of English. And it's remarkable. Everybody, most everybody makes it there most days. And most everybody gets home. And what's even more fascinating to me, I read that uh, more religions practiced in Greater Los Angeles than any other city ever in the history of the world. And uh, more languages spoken too. And, um, so I'm assuming you live in the big city. No, I live on the outskirts looking in with pride. I? I live by the ocean. I have always That's good. Been, and, um, but there's something miraculous about the place. And most people get on most of the time. Even places where there'd be countries that are at war with each other back at home. But guess what? Nobody really feels the need to throw a petrol bomb at each other's kids or nothing like that. Because we, in the main part, have got much more fun things to do in California. And I think that uh, a lot of other countries could have a look at that. Uh, you could probably stop deriding from America and go, oh wow, look at that. But you can't own a, a ferret in California. Quite right too. Unless you're going to put it down your trouser legs. Now that's <laughs> worth watching. Have you ever seen that? No. Fantastic. They, they have to put bicycle clips on each trouser leg right, so as it can't get out of the bottom. And uh, the contestants each put a ferret down their trousers and uh, the one who wins is the one who keeps the ferret down there longest. Sometimes that phrase has to come out quick and it starts nibbing. Once it's got a taste of blood as well, I think. 